Hi, hello, welcome to every Wednesday immigration show with Lucas Garrison. So everyone know we are trying to give the the simplified USA immigration to all Indian community or immigration community. This will continue every week, uh, Wednesday, 6 p.m. Central Time, and uh, we keep trying to update the latest uh, latest uh, updates. What happening this uh, administration, USM administration? Today is the new new day for American and the immigration community. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris took sworn the new journey. I, I think uh, look like uh, just uh, we received the very good news. Lucas will share what is the good news for everyone. This is really very happy news for everyone. So we can uh, first we congratulation to Biden and uh, Kamala Harris. The Kamala Harris is a historical first woman vice president. We we, we congratulate to con congratulation to both and. Uh, the we will welcome to Lucas today Wednesday immigration show. Hello, Lucas. Good evening. Hi, Venkat. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure <clears throat> to be back on the, the forum this week. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So the today is the new day and new journey for American and the immigration uh, community. So what do you think? Maybe you can share your happiness. Well, I mean, I think it's really a great change from what we've been going through for the past four years. And we all know uh, anyone who has anything to do with immigration, it, either as an individual who uh, lives through the process or an attorney or anyone else who supports uh, any of this process, you know, we, we all know how much of a headache it's we've had this past four years and stress and difficulty uh, making sure that everything is uh, taken care of. But, you know, so really good news. You know, we know, um, obviously, uh, Joe Biden is president. He was sworn in today and went to the White House and immediately issued 17 executive orders, uh, reversing quite a bit of what Trump had done uh, or not done in regards to like the coronavirus uh, you know, response. And today, uh, I'm pleased to announce that President Trump, I'm sorry, President Biden has suspended President Trump's uh, uh, implementation of certain programs, travel restri restrictions like the Muslim travel restrictions uh, has been rescinded. The United States has now rejoined the Paris Climate of Accords. Um, and so all these other, you know, harmful regulations that were set to uh, take take effect have also been uh, frozen for 60 days pending review from each agency. Yeah, OK, thank you. Yeah, today we can discuss uh, one by one and uh, we, we will go for we will go with very detailed information. The topic. Um, the first thing. We know that. The Trump leaving to his presidency still is implemented a lot of complicated um, the rules on immigration the community the first one is the DOL and the DH, uh, DOL and DHS final rule so this is it means as for my understanding is uh, even they included to and client to LCA and and client to need to apply the the H1 H1 but I don't know how it will um, implemented but I think you have a very good news on this one. You can share uh, about the DOL and the DHS, uh, the final rule. Right. So the final rules have been, like I said, uh, suspended. You know, they're frozen right now until pending review. Now, just to give everyone a little bit of background of what, what this means, um, you know, the, there are certain things that a president can issue as far as like an executive order or proclamation, such as a travel <clears> ban or or other things, uh, and well, more of a permanent rule would be these, uh, at first the IFRs and now the final rules from DHS and DOL. And it's, the new administration obviously does not support these rules, but there's still certain procedures we have to follow to rescind them. 
so um, again, everyone remembers last fall, we had the excitement with the IFR. Wage levels went up. Uh, we also had expectations in December of possible one-year approvals for H-1s, all these other requirements for third-party offsite employment, um, right to control, uh, among others. And those were thrown out by a court. There are two courts to be specific. Uh, here recently, there was a Supreme Court case that allows USCIS, DOL, or any other agency to continue posting those rules uh, because of uh, you know a new way of the laws interpreted. So now we have what we call the the actual final rule, uh, which is you know derived from the IFRs from last fall. So they're not interim final rules any longer. They're now they're final rules. And uh, the good news is, again, that these are, you know, tabled for the time being. Uh, the two rules, in part, more or less correspond and work together as one. Uh, DHS, which is over USCIS, incorporated a rule that says uh, who is an employer uh, for an employer-employee purpose. So if an H-1B uh, employee, which pretty much 90% of every, every H-1 works uh, for an in-client, uh, is possibly not full time. Um, the this new policy would say, look, the in client um, is you know also qualifies as an employer. So now, uh, based upon that definition, DOL adopts that what DHS says is a new employer, uh, and DOL now can require both employers to file LCA, both employers to file the H-1B petition, and, you know, that would be very disruptive because at the end of the day, what this policy was aimed and created to do is to go after the large Fortune 50 companies and say, look, uh, let's say Apple, for example. Uh, Apple has uh, employees that are there as software developers, and they're making 120000 a year. And I have um, someone who's H-1B through a vendor or, you know, through a consultancy firm, uh, and they pay their, just like the prevailing wage says, they pay that person 94000 a year, uh, which is the legal requirement of, for like, that position, let's say. Well, now, because of this dual filing, USCIS or DOL can now say, look, you're disparaging the workers, American workers, because these workers who are already at Apple make this much more and you're using this temporary service where the, the actual employer pays much less. So we're going to fine you or we're going to you know, do something like that. So that's a real brief you know, explanation of, of what this means. And uh, the good news is, I, you know, obviously, we were expecting it to be you know, set aside. But uh, now we have confirmation it's suspended for another 60 days. And, and I'm sure they're going to start that process tomorrow to rescind these harmful rules. Edmonds, as uh, Biden said before, he started to implement uh, the day one. I think it started to implement it. The first rule is suspended, maybe. Uh, Edmonds, um, do you think uh, what the categories are, maybe what uh, the immigration rules will implement in the next 100 days? It means we hear, it means we saw the uh, in um, the public media saying that first he go he will do for undocumented um, Americans, maybe whoever stay in American who are undocumented, he will do for naturalization within eight years or something. Mm -hmm. Do you have the list what is going to be done next hundred days? We don't. I don't have the specific list it's uh, most of these uh concepts have been you know more or less uh reported through the news media so there hasn't been an official you know today is the first day of the actual term so there's not an official uh record that the president's issued at this time but uh based upon what we know um the, there's multiple groups including people who are uh, backlogged for eb categories right uh, that they want to address and how they're going to have to address this. The president uh, by himself just can't, you know, sign uh, a piece of paper and say, okay, now all the DACA kids have a pathway to citizenship. This is something 
that has to be done through Congress. So we're talking about like what you and I have been talking about, Venkat, for six months now. We're talking about comprehensive immigration reform. This is something that is going to change the code by using Congress, uh, both houses, both the House and the Senate, and then the president signing that into law. Now, between now and the first 100 days, there's a lot of debate, a lot of, you know, we still have a lot of people with a lot of different views of what's the most appropriate way of moving forward with immigration reform. So all that has to be debated and, and planned, but it's very, very good news. So even though I know most of our listeners are hearing uh, news about other groups or other situations, this is also going to incorporate, you know, the, our listeners, and especially like the the EB uh, categories as far, you know, is the backlog and all that goes. So it's very good news. Okay. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So yeah, you you keep saying saying uh, from six months uh, Biden if Biden elected as a president, he gonna do some comprehensive immigration. That it, it means you already told that that will uh, give the give a, a right away a benefit to the all immigration employment immigration. So here, uh, Lucas, I have a small question. So whatever I read or I see that he talking about the 1.1 million undocumented uh, undocumented uh, people in within United States. So first he will take it up employment based or the undocumented. I think you How have to he... look. I think you have to look at it all as a whole because when you're talking about major changes to the law. Um, you know, it all has to be included probably, you know, as much as possible. Uh, and that's where the comprehensive comes from. You know, we want to include change as much as we can and not just do piece by piece. So obviously there's a lot of people who have been, I know our listeners uh, have all been waiting for many years has had hardship in that way, but there's also other people that, you know, might not be able to have a driver's license or might not be able to do other things because of the situation so that, you know, whenever the new plan is announced like this, I think that they usually get the headlines. But like I said, uh, American Immigration Lawyers Association has already sent uh, a pretty thick handbook of what we all want to see changed uh, or issues addressed and, you know, employment based immigrations in there. So, you know, I think as far as like the, the news media, we don't want to be this this uh, heartened from not hearing specifically, hey, we have all these H-1Bs uh, who are stuck in the, you know, in this status and aren't able to change their status for many years. You know, that's not as uh, newsworthy, I guess, as, you know, there's kids that are separated from their parents at the border or people are being held in cages. That's more, I guess, what you would say newsworthy. So that's usually why we hear more of that. Uh, it's a headliner, right? Yeah. Yeah, that is a good information. Lucas, before going to the next next um, question, I'm requesting to all viewers and listeners, you can post your question on YouTube or the Facebook comment page. So we will address your question and we will try to give the more information. And uh, based on that, you can take a right direction and right step for your immigration process. Yeah, Lucas, uh, this, the question, uh, we step back to the DOL and DHL rule. The I, it meant, uh, uh, January 15th, the Trump administration is released to uh, release to DOL and DHL, the H-1B process for the consulting frame. This is also part of uh, DOL, DHL final rule, or this is the two different uh, um, rules? So that there are two different rules, but that's part of the rule we just discussed. So the there's a lot of other small pieces in it, like the wage levels are supposed to incrementally increase, like they were. Um, there's supposed to be other, you know, there are a few other caveats within it, but the main the main uh, purpose of these rules is to go ahead and tie in these uh, third party offsite employments and try and 
I guess, in the mind of the agency to hold others accountable, you know. And I think this is really a misnomer amongst the public. I mean, anytime that there's a chance for someone, a position to be full time, usually the employer, it's better for them uh, to have that person there full time, whether it be an American or H-1B or whatever it might be. And, um, you know, uh, whenever we have these corp to corp agreements where a lot of people work and, you know, we all know these projects aren't necessarily long term. They could be a six month project. It could be a year project. It's, it's a short term duration based upon maybe your skill set or what skills are needed and required at that time. And there's a lot of uh, advancements we have with technology and industry and business that are done because this labor, this talent is available. And just because you make it hard for people to uh, utilize that labor doesn't mean that, that now all these companies are going to go hire all the H-1B employee, employer, employees immediately. Uh, all it's going to mean is these projects aren't going to happen. You know, so it's, yeah, in the end, it's an economic loss for, you know, uh, our economy for society and everything else. So a lot of these businesses that rely on maybe small projects that don't require someone staying on, uh, on boarded as a full-time employee for multiple years. Okay. So we are discussing about the DOL and DHL rule. The one is already you explained, but still I have a couple of questions on that one. Prevailing, prevailing wages. Sure. Right. So this is also suspended uh, as part of uh, DOL DHL rule. But what about the perm application? Even perm application for the green card. Uh -huh. So will it apply the same rule for the um, perm? The prevailing, the prevailing wages, you mean? Prevailing wages, yeah, for Correct. green card. Correct. So the prevailing wages will be affected uh, for both the perm, for the um, E3, H-1B-1, uh, any, any other associated, uh, you know, uh, visa category that would utilize the LCA, okay? So any, any LCA that's utilized that pulls the data from OES uh, would, would have that increased wage. Okay. So how, how much it meant, this is a, you said that this is a suspended, is it temporary or uh, the new administration come up with the new process or new uh, rules or maybe they might change the existing rules and come with uh, any latest rules? No, what, do you, well, what do you think? That, that's a really good question. Um, I think that there's multiple ways that we could go about this. So right now, um, just across the board, because you know, the transition from one president to the other is usually pretty seamless. Uh, they help each other take over, and we have what we call a transition period. Uh, that was pretty much non-existent at this time. So a lot of the new uh, cabinet members are walking into situations they're not fully briefed on. They don't fully understand or know what's going on within each agency at the moment. So this uh, moratorium on these rules uh, allows everyone to have time to evaluate to see what's going on before we just uh, make decisions uh, um, ad hoc, right? Because we don't want to just wipe away. You, you never want the attitude of, I'm just going to cancel everything the other president did just because it's him. You want to analyze it and see what's best for, you know, the agency, America, citizens, so on and so forth. And, um, you know, that once they have a plan of what the good rules are, what the bad rules are, what needs to be changed or what needs to be completely revoked, there's different processes of going through it. You know, so Congress, since these new final rules are so new, Congress can still go in within 60 days and vote on a resolution to remove these rules. The Senate, if they pass it, uh, also and vote and pass it, then it goes to the president. He can sign it and these new rules will go away. That's one method. Another method would be uh, making a new rule to take away these rules through the agency and we'll, they would have postings and uh, notice and comment period. And, uh, you know, another uh, way would be um, a with comprehensive immigration reform, Congress could legislate and write these things through as well. Uh, but the other way would be, uh, you know, ignoring the rule, which up until this 
President Trump, that really never happened. <laughs> but he did that with uh, a rule that came through with Obama for this entrepreneurial rule, and they pretty much just disregarded it. So uh, it's probably not the right procedure to follow, but I guess the president has been set that that's uh, permissible. So I, I really don't I really don't believe that any of these rules will make it through. Okay. So yeah, uh, Biden maybe maybe will bring the new immigration rules or maybe proposal comprehensive immigrations. You you keep saying is comprehensive immigration that will benefit right away for across the the U.S. Uh, U.S. immigration community. So last year we saw this S three eighty six bill uh, is approved both, but uh, there's a two different version is finally it got dead. So do you think uh, this administration will bring this kind of bills to eliminate the country quota? Do you have any information from Isla or? Yes, so that is one of the major points that's going to be included with this comprehensive immigration reform bill. But we're not going to incorporate um, other bills that have already been, you know, shelved more or less. And so there's no point. So you have to remember everything in, in the context of when it happens. Uh, you know, we had a very much bipartisan uh, period of time where uh, we had in the House, it was Democrats controlling, the Senate Republicans controlling, and nothing would, you know, the two bills are not going to, end up being the same or being approved even for the president to sign. So now we have, uh, by virtue of the, the Georgia runoff elections, we have Democrats controlling the House, Democrats controlling the Senate by a slim majority, uh, and we have the president also being a Democrat. So maybe there's concessions that were in the first bill that went through the House that maybe we want more, maybe we instead of saying take and removing the backlog over a period of years, why not just say with this new bill, we're going to issue 1 million new visas to clear up any backlog, you know, and that way it's not phased in or phased out. And it's something that might be immediately available. That's why we were, you and I were informing our viewers to, you know, if at all possible, if you have the opportunity to go ahead and file your adjustment right now, it's pending. I mean, maybe sometime this year we get the great news that, everything's going to move much quicker and you end up with GC. So it's, it's a thing that it's a, it's a once in a 10 year type opportunity. Uh, and, you know, I wouldn't be worried. I wouldn't look to the old bills that kind of went off and died. I'd look forward to the new bills uh, because they're going to offer probably more uh, than what the other bills did. Okay. Um, I think uh, this is the the latest and updated on USA immigration or H1 DOL DHL rules. Lucas, we can go to the next term. The segment is 485. This from October, we even in October month applied a lot of uh, adjust, adjustment of status. Do you have any update to how the process is going on? Yeah, uh, we're receiving, uh, you know, receipts that come through. Um, everything's processing. I already have some clients who've already received uh, their uh, EAD and advanced parole. And, um, you know, just to remind everyone, the you have to go through your biometrics appointment. So uh, depending on where you live and how many people, you know, uh, utilize that facility might determine how fast or how long it takes to get the, the biometrics appointment, um, you know, scheduled. And then obviously once you get the biometrics appointment, uh, you go and you finish that, it might be a few more weeks. Uh, so overall we're seeing, you know, you know, pretty fast movement in that regards for EAD and advanced parole. Okay. In 485, just to be observed, it means we got a couple of inquiries and, uh, the derivative applications. Sure. For kids, it means uh, we got a couple of inquiries on kids. Uh, the primary applicant and wife got receipt number, but even kid did not get 
even the kid did not uh, and cast the ca uh, check. So did we suspect it? So do we suspect anything went wrong the application or for kid only it will take uh, maybe the kid application will take more time to process or slow process. We can say is uh, the slow process. The what do you do? You have any information that one? I mean, some things like this. Uh, if it's a kid, a spouse, or anything else, it could depending. It's a case by case basis for maybe whatever reason it might be. Um, maybe there's a delay in the issue of the receipts. Maybe there's issue where uh, something wasn't filled out correct. I heard reports from Ayla that a lot of people. Uh, had wife and kids rejected because they weren't selecting that they were filing employment based, even though they're not really filing employment based petitions. But as a derivative, you still have to select that. Uh, that's one reason I've heard. It could be maybe the check wasn't honored. Maybe, I mean, there's many different reasons, and it's very specific, you know, for each case. Uh, it could be something where a form wasn't signed, maybe. Uh, maybe the check didn't have when it was presented from the bank. Maybe the funds weren't there. Uh, it could be um, any number of issues. So really, it's a case by case basis. And you know, we'd have to reach out to USCIS to figure out you know what that each reason would be. Okay. The still, if if uh, I have a question about the still who did not receive the receipt number applied in October month is there any way to find out their receipt number there is you could go to ask emma on uscis.gov and you can ask that way you could call customer service uh typically um you're going to be working with a customer service representative so the the people you're interacting with have a maybe a little bit more access to a database to look up the information, but it's not going to be the same as if you speak to an officer. So unless the case is just freshly processed, they're probably not going to have any information. Um, and there's still quite a few people, you know, that we filed that were still pending uh, receipts coming in and, and everything. So it's just a matter of uh, time. You have to remember and be patient that at the same time that every single family or person filed uh, there's 20,000 plus other people filed at the same time. So it's, in a, it's a huge amount of applications that, that were being processed. Okay. Just uh, maybe, I'm not sure you have this answer. Just uh, curious. Do you know how many applications got an October visa bulletin? Do you I have any know, number? I don't know the final number. Um, I'm estimating is between 20, 25,000, but it, it could be easily be more than that but that's that's kind of what i was guess guesstimating based upon the uh previously approved i-140 chart that uscis uh publishes okay okay lucas uh, about the 485 we we have we got a couple of questions so we can take the questions and we can address the questions sure. we got one question from mohan uh, Typically, this is the visa numbers. He's asking about the visa numbers. He's saying that this year employment based visa numbers are 261K. Generally, it means 21,000 for a month. We are in middle of January 2021, means going to be completed almost four months. That means, shall we expect 80K members received GC under employment category this year quota? Can we find court litigation on USCIS not to waste visa numbers? So I think that USCIS is not going to waste the allocation of the visa numbers. Uh, at the same time, you have to remember if you filed uh, here recently, that would, it's going to mean that you're still towards the back of the line in regards to uh, EB2, EB3. So the numbers are still going to move slowly. Now, when we talk about compre comprehensive immigration reform, one of the, the principles we want to correct is if we have uh, one principal uh, immigrant filing and he has a wife and a kid, that all three people count as one for the visa allocation. We don't, as of right now, 
that's three visas that are taken away. So that means the next person in line, if he also has wife and kid, that's two extra visas there and so on and so forth. So it really limits how fast uh, these can be issued, the, the, the visas can be issued and, and, and how fast these, these categories move. So um, th- we'll know a lot more in the next two months or so, trust me. Uh, and, and instead of focusing on our current system with the backlogs and everything, uh, one key change I, I can pretty much assure everyone watching right now is that we are going to have something in, in, within this comprehensive immigration reform package addressing the backlog. And when I say address the backlog, I mean Congress has the power to say we're going to issue one million extra visas just for this purpose. Uh, and by doing so, it would clear the backlog. Okay. So instead of worrying about like, okay, I have my uh, EAD right now and my visa gets current and then the dates retrogress and then next year it comes back and then they retrogress, you know, we don't want people to be stuck in that scenario. So uh, I really think right now this year we're going to see something and it doesn't mean we're going to keep receiving 1 million, for example, extra visas a year. It's just to help take care of this backlog and Uh, You know, the math says right now uh, we have someone who gets uh, an I-140 approved today in EB-2 from India. That's going to be about 70 years before the GC is actually available, which is just uh, absurd. (laughs) Okay. So, Lucas, we can take another question we got from the Vinod. He's uh, inquiring about the I-140 downgrade premium process. So he's asking about when is the right time to file premium process from the receipt date? What are the different scenarios in which is beneficial to file uh, premium process and downgraded and uh, when it is not? Well, Vinod, that's a very good question. I'm glad you brought that up. And I'll tell you my two cents of what how this would be advantageous. Um, number one, if you downgraded and you um, sorry for Hello? interrupting. Are you? Am I there? Yeah. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, someone's calling. Um, if you uh, um, downgrade. Uh, what's going to happen is, uh, you know, you you already you're staying with your employer or going back to a different employer, and maybe you you are happy, maybe everything's fine. Um, the benefit would be is if you could get your I-140 approved, and your adjustment of status is pending for more than six months, it allows you to port your job to another employer without having to refile your labor without having to refile adjustments or anything else is pretty much you would just have to file a supplement J when your visa is available, showing that you still have gainful employment, that the position is same or similar to the original position that you petitioned for. So um, the benefit to that would be uh, portability. If you're happy with your employer, if you have don't really want to move or anything like that, there's really no benefit at the moment to go ahead and, uh, you know, go through premium processing. It's more about planning to what your future might be, if that makes sense. Okay. Let's say if if you plan to uh, premium, maybe uh, process and premium process. So do you think uh, we'll get any queries on that one or will go smooth and process? It just depends on each case, really. Um, the most common RFE that you could get on this type of case would be the, especially if you go back to an employer you don't work for anymore and you downgrade, would be the ability to pay the wage. Um, that's most common. Um, you Usually, you know, if you're going from EB2 to EB3, the job posting that was in the perm uh, is going to qualify for EB3 because uh, the bare minimum, you know, EB3 where it's just a skilled worker or you know, it's not a professional with a master's of two years or a bachelor's plus five. So you could have bachelor's and only need one year, you know, whatever it might be. So 
it's a, it's more safe. The, the really the main RFE that you would see is probably going to be the ability to pay the proffered wage. Okay. I think uh, thanks, Vinod, for, for your question and uh, bring in this show. This is a very important question. This is valuable for everyone who can mm -hmm. take their application to premium process. Very up to them to whether they go to the premium process or not. Thanks, Lucas. Lucas, we can we go for the next question we got from Ramesh. Uh, this is related to the 485 derivative. The primary applicant uh, I, I-485 accepted and uh, got received, but dependent application rejected due to the improper filing. You already told. The question is, can we reapply for the dependent even the dates ret retrogressed? or should we go for litigation? You can refile. So what you would want to try and do, is, since the instructions are not clear on that, um, you know, you'd want to probably try and file a nunc pro tunc, uh, which would allow you to have them accepted because of that situation. Um, you know, I haven't come across any of those yet. I haven't tried that. Uh, but your attorney might be able to resubmit requesting that. Uh, as far as litigation goes, I don't know um, how we could proceed with a case. Um, it would, you know, it, it it would have to. I'd have to look into that more as far as like to find out how you would have standing to to move forward with that that matter. Um, but more than likely, the best thing to do is the agency to go ahead and reaccept the case uh, that was filed. Um, and then, you know, like I said, there's a lot of people from what I heard, you know, that your spouse, they wouldn't select uh, employment based, you know, uh, or that she, you know, that she's a beneficiary of a I-140 or something like this on the adjustment of status application. That's the main cause of these rejections. So. Um, I would try that and then also, um, you know, hopefully with, you know, that's all going to be moot in a couple of months and uh, it won't matter. So you can, you know, hopefully refile even if they reject the case. Okay. Yeah, thanks, um, Ramesh. Maybe, maybe you can check with your attorney for the more information or else if you send, if you have any additional question, on top of it, you can send an email to Lucas mm -hmm. BG uh, info at the BG .com. Lucas will reply appropriate information to you. Thank you, Ramesh. Uh, Lucas, here I have a one scenario. So I will explain first, then uh, I will ask the question. Give me your the suggestion. Suggestion we got from the Ravi. We, we got from Ravi. He worked for company A for almost five years. During his employment with company A, they filed GC under EB3 category by, by, by filling POM in EB3. Then after he received EB3 I-140, um, he's a USA master graduate. The second time the company again filed POM and I-140 under EB2 category. Before completing 180 days after receiving EB2 I-140, I think then he moved company B. He currently working for company B and my GC form is under process. The here question is, his priority date was 2014 September. In, 20, in 2020 October, when dates moved company A, said my position was still open and allowed me to file my 485 under EB3 category. Uh -huh. With his previous approved EB3 I-140 under future employment, now he received 485 and EAD receipt last month. His question was, after I received EAD, should I go back to company A? or can I transfer my 485 to my current company B and continue to continue my job? 
what challenges will be facing in transferring to B, and uh, he is asking, he is asking the recommendation. What well, would you recommend it? I can't recommend, you know, what which company to do. So obviously, if company A they filed your uh, I one forty, they never revoked it. Then you filed uh, based upon a current offer for future employment. You filed your adjustment of status. Uh, if if that application uh, using Supplement J, if that application is pending for more than six months, uh, whenever you get an RFE for, you know, a, a updated Supplement J to show that the offer is still there, you can get that from Company B uh, as long as the job is same or similar, uh, you know, in function. So really um until the visa is available for where your gc is actually getting close to being processed there's not much to really worry about at this stage uh, you don't have to be working for company a now or really anytime uh you, until after you get your gc then it's you know uh, a good idea to probably work for them but between now and then when you get the gc if you want to stay with company b that's that's fine and if, if if company b would sign a supplement j that would uh incorporate you know where they take over the petitioning uh spot you know that that's permissible as well okay i think ravi you got um, appropriate information for your question still if you have any if you want any information, you can send an email to info at bgimmlaw.com. Lucas will address your questions. Yeah, thank you, Lucas. And you. Uh, we have we have a couple of questions. Uh, another from Patak. So his question is: Adjustment of status is filed on October 26 and got received. He got received, but last week company announced layoff and his role might be impacted or impacted so he said that i have a job until april 30 what if i join new employer early before completing 180 days from adjustment of status filing what happens if before joining new employer my i-140 downgraded does not get approved and also ead and advanced payroll his question is what are options i understand so the most important thing is that your i-140 is protected so maybe this is a good example of wanting to get the premium uh upgrade and uh you know make sure your i-140 is taken care of because if your i-140 at the end of the day if your i-140 is denied obviously the adjustment application is going to be denied as well so if in this scenario if your company you're with, if you end up moving on to a different company tomorrow, it doesn't have to be when the I-140 is approved or anything else. If you get a different opportunity or you need to move on from this uh, situation, you can. And as long as your I-140 is approved and, and not withdrawn by the current uh, petitioner, a future uh, company can go ahead and, and you know take the position. Now, I want everyone to remember this. Whenever we're talking 180 days, okay, uh, the final action date would have to be current, number one, and you would be issued an RFE or at the time of interview, you would just bring in the new supplement J. It's not, it's not a hard and fast rule that on, you know, 181 days, uh, you're going to have uh, to get a new letter or anything else. That's that usually, you know, I've heard of people maybe going between one or two other companies before they actually have to go in for the final interview or the final RFE to show the supplement J. So, um, you know, it, it really, I want everyone to have peace of mind knowing as long as you have this filed and you have I-140 and everything's taken care of, these provisions and these laws are meant to protect you as a worker. We don't want you to feel... Um, that you're you're shackled to one company or or not have the freedom to move or make a career change these laws are put in place to make it easy for you to to make a choice that's best for you and your family to to do what's you know in your best interest so uh keep that in mind and and uh the most important thing like i said we have to have the i-140 
approved. So if you have the chance and you want to upgrade, and this is a similar situation to, to what you might have, go ahead and, and see if you can upgrade. Uh, and then that way you have the peace of mind knowing that moving forward, your adjustment's still going to be active, even if it's with a different employer. Okay. Thank you, Lucas. Patek, I think uh, you got the information from Lucas. Maybe if you have any question in future, you can send an email to info at bgimmlaw and glad. maybe you might clarify about your question in future. I hope uh, you maybe I hope you cleared on your question and you, you you got information about your question. Lucas, we have another question from Vishnu. Uh, yeah, this one is I I I forgot it asked before. We talk about the DOL and DHL, the final rule and uh, the H1B process. What about the uh, wage level H1B ladder will be implementing CAP 2022? Very good. I think we forgot that. We went straight to some questions. Uh, yeah. So just like these other rules, the H1B uh, fiscal year 2022 CAP uh, is, is, uh, is impacted. Uh, as we've discussed in the past couple of weeks, you know, this new rule proposes that we have more of a bidding system where we're bidding on uh, higher paid wages, certain uh, occupations, uh, meaning certain SOC codes, uh, certain uh, geographic locations. These are all factors for that. And the, the harm for this is actually going to be that you can't if if I want to be wage level four, my employer just to be selected in the lottery, my employer just can't say I'm going to pay you level four wage. You have to have some substantive evidence showing that the position actually is wage level four, not so much just salary. So what does this mean? A typical software developer uh, position requires a bachelor's degree at the minimum for the position, not for the person working there. We have to remember what the position is. So maybe the position says uh, I need someone with a bachelor's degree and two years of experience, you know, working with J2EE or something like this. Well, that right there is just a wage level uh, one job. If I say I need uh, someone with a master's degree to work, you know, with a background in J2EE, well, that moves it up to a wage level two. Or if I have a bachelor's degree and five years of experience, that moves it up. So we add points based upon what the job duties and requirements are. So what a lot of people have to do is you're going to have to show why a wage level was selected was appropriate, much like how we did a, a few years back, how we had the wage level one issues. We had to prove it's still a specialty occupation, even though we selected wage level one. You know, this is this vice versa. It's the same thing, just on the other end of the scale. Uh, so that's one of the, the main things uh, that's coming up. Uh, and, and I think really that, you know, this rule is going to be, um, you know, put aside. It's not going to be used. This is probably the easier rule to not use because of, uh, you know, the registration tool and everything else, the requirements to change, the requirements to add all this information. It would just be uh, a huge burden to undertake. And then so... Already we are in January 20. Maybe we have the two months to apply. Maybe maybe end of the end date for the application for 2022 cap. So do you think uh, we'll go impl will implement it by March 20? Uh, well, we will we'll go will will we'll, impl we'll take a process the previous year cap 2021. You have to remember, like what we said in the first part of the show, this would also be what we call a comprehensive immigration reform. You know, this would be something that could be addressed to say, look, you know, maybe every year the cap numbers are too low. There's too much demand for this program. Maybe there's too much uh, visas available. Maybe they want to restrict it more. You know, this is something that would be addressed and that they would address that point, too, at that time. So um, I, I am even if that does not happen, there's going to be uh, court challenges that would put that aside. And there's really no basis in law uh, for, for the agency to have come up with this rule to begin with. Uh, I do also want to, because it sounds like he is an F1 student, I want to bring this up real quick. 
uh, here recently, ICE has also implemented a new process or program through SVEP or SEVIS also to do like a, a site visit check on OPT students. So most H-1Bs know we have virtual site visits now. You'll get a phone call or email from an FDNS officer. Well, that's going to be expanded now to uh, OPTs, STEM OPTs, CPTs, uh, you know, to verify training, to verify uh, what job you're doing, how it relates to your degree, uh, and so on and so forth. So there's going to be a few changes. If you do receive any notice or any contact from someone from ICE, it's not to mean you're in trouble or done anything wrong. It's just a matter of collecting information. Okay. Uh, Lucas, one second, Edmonds. I'm requesting all viewers, I'm requesting you, if you have any question, maybe you can post right away. We will take a take your question and address, or else maybe we will end show in within five minutes or within 10 minutes. Lucas, we discussed um, a lot of information about the Trump administration implemented the rules and uh, Biden, what is going to be proposed immigration. So the H1, so this, if let's say who the regular H1 exemption code or H1, what do you think? The wage level is same, the previous one, or it it going to be change, or is any any rules got changed for the regular H ones? Well, that's what we were saying at the beginning. the The wage levels were going to incrementally increase, like they, they it's not going to be a drastic one day to the next, like it was in October, but they're going to uh, increase by increments over a year. Uh, again, I I don't believe this rule is going to be around long enough for that to happen. Um, and, and you have to remember, um, these Fortune 50 companies, big tech, that rely on most of these uh, visas and assistance from people, like they don't, you know, Google's, the Apple's, the Microsoft, the Facebook, those companies, they don't want uh, more restrictions on these visas because that's that would be harmful to their business. And they have a strong lobby uh, where they can, you know, pick up the phone and speak to people in the that have they're in Washington and really let their voices be heard because of you know their political influence but uh, it's in their best interest also for this to kind of go away so uh, I really like I said I, I think it's an exciting time I don't think we should be worried about you know pending uh, doom and gloom I think we should really be looking forward to um, you know positive change and I do want to add this now that if, if no one else has any questions just to close the, on this note from my side you know we all want to uh, make sure we reach out and uh, communicate with our representatives uh, our constituents we want to make sure you speak find out who where you live uh, and who your representative is for congress email them call them let them know hey i'm here i'm working i've been working for five years i pay taxes this is something important to me and this is something that would help me you know, same with the senator, um, you know, U.S. senator. You can call them, email them, do as much as you can. That's how change is made for the most part to, to get a benefit. You you know, by sitting still and not saying anything or just waiting, uh, it's going to be, you know, uh, many years to get any type of benefit, if at all. So the best thing we can do right now is since all this is on the table, start calling, start flooding the office uh and, and letting people know. We, we do know, um, I think last week, a new uh, president was selected for the Telugu Association of North America. And, um, you know, we obviously have the benefit of working with other organizations to help, you know, uh, you know, speak for a whole group of people. But at the end of the day, if everyone spoke and relayed this information to their representative, uh, we can really have, you know, some some positive change and address issues that need to be addressed. Okay. The Lucas one one is information. If anyone is interested to call to the senator or congressman, so they want if they want to send an email, uh, 
if it, if they come to us and ask about do do we have any kind of template so that uh, with the proper um, with the proper information to send senator or congressman can we help them we can uh that's not a problem at all to to share templates the best thing i can tell you is to write something personal from each individual means the most uh, you know we often request the uh, help of rep uh, representatives or senators you know when maybe things are getting stalled within the administration they'll help us go and push a case through you know, USCIS or whatever it might be uh, to help move it along. But at the same time, these the representatives are here. To, they want to help us. And if we have enough voices that are heard, that will help uh, give insight. Because if, there, if Congress is going to issue comprehensive immigration reform, if the representative doesn't necessarily know that, this, that there's an issue impacting people, how are they going to know to fix that issue? You see, so... Uh, the best thing to do is just to, you know, specify in your own words, you know, hey, I'm uh, here, I live in your district, I'm on H-1B, uh, I've been in this H-1B uh, visa for eight years, I have a, my employer wants to sponsor me for my green card, but due to so many people uh, also applying at one time, this is delayed and, you know, it's, it, my kid's a U.S. citizen and it gives us uncertainty in the future of, of where we're going to live long term. Uh, and it doesn't give us that security. You know, something like that in each person, the more you have your own story in that, the, the more effective it's going to be. OK, yeah, thank you. Thanks for information. Yeah, I think uh, we 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 are attending the show. Today, you provided a lot of good information and uh, we discuss a very detailed information about final rule and uh, DOL, DHL. Uh, till now, we hear a lot of complicated rules and the um, uh, immigration process. Going forward, every week we will might be, we might be get good news every week. Hopefully, the Biden will implement the comprehensive immigration will advance. It means uh, all immigration community will benefit out of it. So hopefully he will do right way and um, maybe he will take a process where he simplified the, the immigration process. So uh, that's uh, today, Lucas. OK. Uh, yeah, one second, Lucas. I think uh, we got a uh, one question from Facebook, Santosh. Last, uh, we, we take a last question. Uh, if we have both H4 EAD and GC EAD, which one should be held and why? Oh, that's a good question, Santos. Thank you for following us and watching the program. Uh, you know, really, uh, what you want to do is uh, maintain your non immigrant status until we have GC in hand, if at all possible. So if you're already on H4 EAD and you get you know, GC EAD. Um, the benefits of GC EAD are far greater than H4 EAD in the sense that uh, it'll be renewed for only once it, um, every year. But right now, you know, if you're if you have H4 EAD and you're you filed it, but you haven't received the card before the the expiration date, you know, you can't work. On uh, GCEAD, you can keep working with the receipt in your hand for six months. So if you can file a few, you know, six months early for the for the renewal, and you know your GCEAD expires, you can keep working for six more months on the receipt. So it gives you more of a cushion, uh, so you don't have that situation of losing your position waiting on the EAD card for H four. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Sandesh, for your question. And also, we got a final question from Vilas. Uh, Vilas is asking that uh, one of the students got EAD. Uh, card is uh, received at home, but um, it written back due to unavailability at home. In this scenario, what is the process to get the student EAD? Uh, you would want to contact uh, USCIS 
uh, notify them of the card being non-delivered and uh, verify the address and they'll resubmit the card. But you need to do it in a timely manner um, to make sure that, you know, the card's not destroyed. So go ahead and, and reach out USCIS.gov. You can call the 1-800 number uh, for customer service. Uh, but either way is, is beneficial and you, you probably you'll be on the phone waiting for a little bit of time, but you need to do it ASAP so you don't lose the card. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think uh, we we are at we we are at seven seven p.m. I think we are at ending the show. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you today having with Telvenara Radio. Do you want to share apart from this anything else? No, I think that you know it's an exciting day. Uh, a lot of change is hopefully coming. Um, I hope everyone's been able to you know, appreciate the, the change that we've had. Um, and I just want to, again, sincerely thank everyone for following us on our Facebook page, both Telugu NRI radio and our office uh, Facebook page. Also, you know, uh, if you have any questions, we're here is to support the community. Uh, don't be, you know, afraid of asking a question because I guarantee you there's probably two or three people similar to you that have the same scenario. Uh, and, you know, a any other events that transpire with with uh, good news, we'll go ahead and, and try and have an immediate show or something like that to update everyone accordingly. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, each and everyone who participated today. And uh, thank, especially thank for who sent their questions. We hope you got uh, proper information from Lucas. So this show is a very important. It, it primarily intention is uh, the bring USA immigration and uh, very detailed and uh, transparency information and reach out transparent information to the the immigration community. Uh, we are trying to better David. Hey, you can post your questions or your topic on Telugu Radio Facebook or you can or BG the Burgos and Law, Law Firm Facebook, or else you can send an email to bg at immlaw.com. We will take your question and topic and next uh, the coming shows, and we will address your scenario will help to the across the community. A lot of people, maybe the same scenario fall into the, the other person also fall into the same scenario that will help to others so we are encouraging to participate every Wednesday evening, 6 p.m. Central Time on Immigration Show and Telugu NRA Radio. Thank you very much, everyone, to particip participate in today's show. And um, we will continue this show every Wednesday, and we will catch up next week, the same time, the same show. Until then, bye. Good night. Good day. Thank you.